us have heard some kind of saying about pride, right? Pride goes before the fall. fall. Like we've all heard of that one. Uh, I, I've got a great one here from a, a scholar, Andrew McGray, way back in 17th century Christian. He said, pride, pride leaves no room for grace. Oof, there's a deep mm -hmm. saying. Uh, I think all of us probably at some point in our lives with work have said, I take pride in my work, right? I take pride in something uh, special in regards to my work. But uh, I got to tell you, there's, there's one doctor, one philosopher that I think just absolutely nails um, the, the, just the pinnacle of, of pride. And he's a philosopher that many of you have known for years. His name's Calvin. Not just any Calvin, but Calvin and Hobbes. Oh man, he, if you know anything about that, he is just all about pride. But I know we can't quite see it, but he, he, he says, I think everyone makes the wrong kind of New Year's resolutions. All they do is promise, stop bad habits, start good habits. Hobbes says, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, it's not enough to change a few little habits. Everybody I know needs a complete overhaul, right? He needs a complete overhaul. And so from this point forward, for the next two months, I will be spending my days yelling and telling people what I hate about them <laughs> and how they need to change. And then, of course, they crash. You can see there. And I love that. Just Hobbes is like, you're an inspiration to all of us. <laughs> right? But Calvin says, you know what? My New Year's resolution is not to change at all. So we'll just see how this goes. But I, I think like we all have that, right? That pride where they need to change. Not me, right? It's their issue, not me. And we want them to change, not on. And so, uh, unfortunately, if you look at Luke 14, pride is, is just full, it's just in our hearts everywhere, guys. And we want to be healthy. We want to be healthy. So that means we need to, to admit our pride. We need to admit that we need, we need Jesus. Lord, I need thee every hour, amen, right? There's a song we just had. We need thee every hour. We need thee with every moment for our attitudes. Because it's probably a prideful attitude. Uh, and, and, and since we're going to be in Luke for the next month or so, it might even be six weeks as we finish out the year, uh, I'm going to say pride. What are you guys going to say? You're going to say humble. Because that's the opposite, isn't it? We need to be humble. There's only one way to do this, to get it in our brains. Lord, I need the every hour. I need that humility. And so let's, let's practice. I'm going to say pride. You're going to say humble. Ready? Pride? Humble. humble. Oh, awesome. That was, we don't even need to practice again. Because that was so good. That was amazing. That was amazing. So here we go. Luke 14. We will read the first 14 verses, but the parable that we will be looking at is verse 7, okay? So verse 1 for the context. As it happened, Jesus went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, and they watched him closely. Behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Jesus answered, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Right? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. So he took the sick man. He took him and healed him, and he let him go. They answered him, saying, Which of you, which of you having a donkey or an ox that's fallen into a pit, won't you immediately pull him out of the, on the Sabbath? They couldn't answer him regarding these things. Verse 7 is the parable. So Jesus told a parable to those who were invited, and he noted how they chose the best places, and he said to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and, and him come and say to you, give place to this man, then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, come up here to a higher place. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit around at the table. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to him who invited Jesus to the to the event when you give a dinner or a supper don't ask just your friends your brothers your relatives nor your rich neighbors lest they also invite you back and you'll be repaid instead give a feast invite the poor invite the maimed the lame the blind 
you will be blessed. Why? Because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amen? Amen. The word of God this morning. Jeremiah, can you come up here for us today? Come on, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, we're going to have you pray for us in, in our time in the word. One more time. Pride? I'm humble. Awesome. We're losing a couple again. Stay awake, right? <laughs> So if we, if we have our notes, go ahead and, and pull those out. You'll see at the very top, as we get started, there's two verses. There's two verses. We've got Proverbs chapter 3 at the top, the very top of your, your notes there. You'll see James chapter 4 and Proverbs chapter 3 that, that uh, we need to be careful of our pride. Because why? The Lord's, the Lord's in resistance to that. How about James 4, right? That, that, that idea that if you humble yourselves before the Lord, he will what? He'll lift you up. He'll exalt you. Guys, this is so crucial. It's not enough for me to sit here and say today, you need to watch your pride. Like, we need a complete overhaul, don't we? We need a complete overhaul in our heart, and Jesus exposes that. And uh, as we see in verse 1 here, again, we were in Matthew, Matthew for the last couple of weeks, but Luke... Luke is a doctor, okay? So if we, if we flip to our, our, next, uh, our, our next slide, you can see some of the context there. Luke is a doctor, and he's an apostle, and he is not writing to Jews uh, as Matthew was. Matthew's a tax collector, and he's writing to say, hey, Jesus is the king of the Jews. Luke is a doctor, and he's writing, as you see, to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he is some kind of government official. He's not the king, but he's giving an individual report. A doctor to this person about how amazing Jesus is. And what a shock. Luke has the most healings from Jesus. That makes sense because he's a doctor, right? And so Jesus is our great physician. And so Luke is writing from that in an individual basis. And we see in chapter 13. Go ahead and take your Bible, okay? Just, just one page. It's probably just like mine there, right? One page. And look at chapter 13. Right before Jesus is invited to this person's home, right as he's about to have a banquet and, a, and a, just a good old-fashioned Baptist after church special, right? Amen to that. <laughs> We're going to have some grub. We see that in chapter 13, verse 22, in all of Scripture, this is one of the most important questions. And, and someone is, is asking Jesus on the way down the road, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus, are there going to be a lot of people that are saved? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Many, many are going to seek to enter. They're going to go through the wide, but narrows the gate, narrows the door. Many will, will stand outside and, and knock, saying, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, I, I don't know you. So let me go back to this church. Are there going to be a lot of people saved? From the words of Jesus, no, there are not. There are going to be many people striving in different ways to, to try to, to get to heaven on their own or do some, something else in their own pride and their own human effort. That's pride, isn't it? And they will be rejected. They will, no, I don't know you. Instead, the person that humbles themselves, the person that humbles themselves will be saved. We have to, in our sin, say, Lord, I need thee. Amen. I need you to save me because I cannot do it. And so Jesus, after lamenting over Jerusalem, that, that this is a city that should be ripe for revival. This is the holy place, guys. This is the foundation of, of Judaism and, and, and Jesus and prophets. Instead, it's lost as ever because a lot of it's about human effort. And that brings us to chapter 14. Jesus, he goes in into the house of one of the, the lawyers and the Pharisees to eat bread with him on the Sabbath. And they watch him closely. Uh, I, I'm not sure, as we look at verse 1, if you were ever part of a clique. Are there cliques at the high school? Are there, are there cliques and no cliques? Oh, there's a clique in Glendale. I know it, because there was in Glide, right? They're like, you, you, there's people that I'm going to hang out with. And, and I remember, I was a nerd, full disclosure, right? I have a Pez collection. I own that. Okay, so what a shock. I did not fit in during high school. <laughs> but I remember I hit junior year, and I started taking AP classes. Advanced placement. And that's where a lot of the students, they, they worked really hard. And so, man, I really started to fit in because they're nerds too. All right. And they're even smarter. All right. 
And uh, so I started to get in with them, and, and it just was awesome to be part of that. And if we look at verse 1, the reason I bring the click up, that, that <coughs> is because Pharisees and lawyers, guys, it's the ultimate click in Judaism. The ultimate, they hang out and do everything. Why? Because a lawyer, like Congress, they're going to set what you can and can't do for Judaism. And then guess what the Pharisees are going to model? We're going to start modeling it, right? So Congress makes a law, and then, of course, it's up to, to other people to either pass it, and then we need to abide by it, right? That's what's happening on a local level here. And notice verse 1. It says they were watching him closely. And, and there was a guy that had dropsy in verse 2. There's a guy that comes there. And uh, I'm not sure how, how political you guys are, but have you ever heard of the phrase, there's a plant? There's a plant. For example, you'll have some big political uh, event or maybe a rally, and then all of a sudden somebody will jump up in the middle, try to intentionally interrupt the speaker or the ruler or the king or whoever. Why? It's a plant, right? They planted that person there to throw the person off. And that's what's happening. Verse 2, there's a man there who had what? He had dropsy. And as we see here on the screen, dropsy is, is basically a lot of excess fluid. It's where we get to the word for medical for, for edema. It's, it's like your skin is just going to swell. And it's not going to kill you. You're probably not going to get dis disabled, uh, you know, monthly check. But it's not comfortable, is it? Uh, to be to be totally appropriate, uh, at, at my grandma's, you know, as you get older, she would talk about needing to take the water pill, right? And, and, and I've just got all this excess fluid down on my, my legs. Is it comfortable to walk? No. But can you walk? Yeah, you can get by. Uh, we see that this man, obviously he can see, he can hear, so he's not as, as, as lame as some of the other ones that Jesus has healed. But it's not comfortable, is it? It's not comfortable. I remember when Tanya was pregnant uh, with Hope. This is 2015. Uh, I went on a mission trip, and, and right as I'm leaving, she goes to the hospital, and it turns out she's got a kidney stone. Oh, man, those are just living the dream, aren't they? Especially when you're pregnant, right? Like, oh, man, just agony, agony. And I remember Tanya saying, I just have to keep drinking water at the same time. My ankles are so swell. It's annoying. It hurts. And so here's this man with dropsy. He's a plant. They're trying to trick him. And Jesus asks, verse 3, asks a very basic question. Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? What do you guys think? Let's take a poll. How many think it's okay to heal on the Sabbath? Yeah, wow, only a couple of you participated. All right. How many of you are lazy? All right, okay. Nobody else? Okay, just check. <laughs> so we have, we have this, this idea here, verse 3. The obvious answer is yes, it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. I, I think I put on your... I put on your notes just all the healing that Jesus did on the Sabbath intentionally. Guys, if you're not supposed to work, Jesus literally said, be healed. Boy, looks like he just really put up a sweat. I mean, he's going to need union benefits and everything. I mean, he might need medical. The, the effort that Jesus had to put in to just say, be healed. Seems like he really, really wore himself out. That's a 40-hour work week right there. No, it doesn't take anything for Jesus to say, be healed, right? Your, your sins are forgiven. That he's God, he can do that. And so here Jesus is exposing the fact that they just don't want to help anybody. Just, we just don't want to help them. We just don't want to help them. We don't want to show compassion. It sounds like that's a prideful attitude, doesn't it? Let's practice. Here we go. Pride? Oh. Yeah, we're supposed to stay so humble, and, and we want to help that person. Instead, these leaders that make the rules, make the laws. Uh, again, we see it today, folks. Uh, if you go down to, to Costco, if you go into uh, uh, Sherm's or Thunderbirds, some of them you'll see next to the actual price, this was approved kosher, right? A Jewish individual, a Jewish rabbi came by and said this was okay. The rules are very prevalent. Even to this day, Jesus is unmasking. It's all about pride. He just didn't want to do it. He just didn't want to do it. And so they're... Their spiritual superiority, their pride, we see in ourselves, don't we? They just don't want to help that guy. They just don't want to do it. Verse 4, they didn't want to answer. And so he took him, Jesus took the man, healed him, and, and, and asked a very practical question. If you had a donkey or an ox and they fell into a pit, wouldn't you pull them out on the day? Absolutely you would. Why? Because your livelihood depends on it. If you had a donkey or a cow or an ox, that's, that's meat. Once you are done, or the, 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 the ox is too old, it's also, you can sell it and get some money that way, and how are you going to plow your fields? 
right? It is your livelihood. It's a part of who you are. It's how you would survive. You would absolutely pull it out, okay? And so Jesus exposes, you would do that for an animal. How come you're not helping me? Pride. Because you don't want to. Verse 7, so he told them a parable. And, and what's so great is Jesus is going to tell a parable. And, and Jason, as a teacher, Randy, like I know one of the best and most effective methods as being a teacher is when there's a moron in your class. That came out wrong. When there's a disbehaving student, disobedient student in your class, you go out. Really effective methods. Yo, quit being, a, a, quit being a moron. That really works well, doesn't it? You get written up. Maybe you should, should have a self-awareness training about calling people names. One of the best things you can do is actually promote in a different way the behavior you want to see. So instead of pointing out, man, you guys are all dummies, that you don't even help this guy. Instead of berating them, instead of picking on them, as teachers can do, parents can do, why do you do it like your brother? Instead of doing that, Jesus, right here, verse 7, he exposes it through a story. And so he says, uh, he notices that how you how you sit, and he said to them in verse eight, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding, don't sit down in the best place, lest someone more honorable than you be invited. He who invited you, uh, <clears throat> he who invited you would have to come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you, with shame, would have to take the lowest place. Okay, so uh, if, if we go ahead and, and look at the screen here, you can see that in Jewish time, remember they reclined. Right? They recline. They don't sit around the table like, they, like we do. They recline, and you'll see there's a, a kind of a couch with three people in the middle. That's your big wigs. That's where the, the head honchos sit. And when you have a wedding, as we saw in Matthew, you walk through the town. Everybody's having a great time. The husband and wife, they, they pick each other up through the town and celebrate. They're on the, the right and the left, and the father is in the middle because he's the patriarch, right? He's the main guy. So you have these really important people sitting there. And we know that Jesus, after, after a Sabbath, uh, kind of like church, you know, they're, they're down there at the synagogue. You're going you're gonna to go to eat. You're going you're gonna to have the teacher there because not everyone's educated. And so they're going to sit up there. And what happens if you accidentally sat up at the front and then some big wig doctor came through? So I'm having you over for dinner. And, and, and we, Tanya's making something great. We all come over there. Man, I'm going to sit up at the front. And I forgot to tell you guys, Billy Graham was coming. It's awkward, Jason. I'm going to need you to sit in the back now because uh, Billy Graham's going to be over here. It's, like, it's awkward, isn't it, to go back through there? Uh, another example would be just, just again, it, it's about that person, right? That with, everything's revolving around them because that was the special event. If you're at a wedding, okay, and I've done five weddings, and I'm so excited to tell you guys today, all five of them are still together. Okay, so I, my ratio is 100%, just to, not to brag, but if you get married, married by me, you're still going strong for two years ago. <laughs> so it's, uh, but it, if I'm up there doing the wedding, it's quote, whose day? It's, it's their day. And if I'm up there and, and uh, doing the wedding and do you take the, right, and sickness and health, and I'm going through that and I start like making it about me as the, as the officiant, that's awkward, isn't it? Because the day's about, it's about them, right? And so here, Jesus says, if you're going up there, you need to make sure you don't do that. Instead, what should you do? Verse 10. You should go intentionally and sit down there by the door, basically. By the door. If you, if you come to our house and there's a lot of people, I just want to apologize now if you have to sit by the door where everybody drops their shoes off. That wasn't intentional, okay? But that would be the equivalent, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit there intentionally where everyone's taking off their muddy, dirty shoes. Jesus says you should go that intentionally at the lowest place so that when he who does invite you says, friend, come up here, come up here. I felt bad last week because we had a lot of people over for dinner uh, after church, and there's good Mary. She's a good sport, but Mary sat in the back. Now, she'll, tell, she'll swear to this day, I was fine. You don't need to dawdle over me, but I felt horrible because here's a woman with a bad back sitting in a bad place, right? Come, come, sit up at the front. Right? Come up here and kick Jason out. Right? He's got a good back. Right? <laughs> no. We, we intentionally, we go and sit by that spot. And as you see on verse 9 there on the screen, in humiliation, that idea there, guys, as you see, the, the Greek, it's, it's to lower yourself. Right? You're intentionally going to, it's not about me. I believe the famous words, Francis Chan, we've said it many times, goy. Goy. Can we say that on three? 
One, two, three. Glory. Glory. Get over yourself. Right? Get over ourselves. The world does not revolve around us. And Jesus says you should intentionally seek out a lower position. And I got to tell you, our world is full of self, isn't it? Mm. Our world is full of self. Mm. You and I are full of self. It's devastating. Folks, in 2013, are you ready for this? In 2013, the word of the year was selfie. It was selfie. In 2020, when people had to stay home from COVID, guess how many photos they took of themselves? The selfie. We took over 20 billion selfies and posted them online. 20 billion. The, the world population is 7 to 8 billion, depending on who you ask. That means we took that many more photos of who? Not others, not doing good. Here's how I could serve someone else. And we were, we were trying to make a meal for them. We stayed at home and did what? We took photos of ourselves. Oh, man. And I'm guilty, too. And I don't even look that good. I can understand why somebody else does. But, man, I don't even look that great. But we make it all about ourselves. Guys, last year, excuse me, this year we are on pace to take 1.7 trillion photos of which, after COVID, life is back to normal. At least we can go outside, right? Like, we, we don't have to be stuck at home kind of thing. We're not quarantined. We're still going to take 25 billion selfies. So even though we stayed at home, we're ready to get back out and maybe we can actually interact with others. No, we're actually on pace to take more selfies. One more time. Pride? Humble. Pride? Humble. We need it. We need a humility, don't we? I want to be absolutely clear at this moment. We live for self. Our society lives for self. Let him back his church. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ begins in humility. Amen? Amen? That Jesus came on our behalf. He did not seek his own. Instead, Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself so that he could die on the cross for our sin. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus literally lived this out. And the gospel begins with Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's bleeding out on our behalf. And the gospel, the good news, begins with me, you, all of us saying, I need Jesus. I cannot do it on my own. I'm full of sin, the lying, the cheating, the gossip, the profanity, sexuality. I'm the problem. Jesus, I need salvation. Amen? It takes humility, doesn't it? It takes humility to say that. Unfortunately, in America, I got all I need. I got my money. I got my retirement. I got, I got a house. I got room and board. I got shelter. I'm good. Our problem's obesity. Our problem's obesity in America. Wow. We don't need God, and here's God. Look at your verses on your notes, guys. Humble yourselves, and who will exalt you? He will exalt you. The prideful person the Lord will resist. There is no way to get into heaven with a prideful person. Those who are saved, they are the ones that say, I need thee every hour. Lord, I need thee every hour. I cannot be the leader you want me to be. I can't be the father, the, the, the spouse, without the humility. Jesus, I need you. A prideful person says, I don't need God. A prideful person in Proverbs also says, a fool says in his heart, I don't need God. A fool is directly prideful and in resistance to the Lord. Come on, Baptist Church. I pray that's not us. Mm -hmm. I pray that's not us. One more time, pride. Humble. Oh, no. We need the humility of Christ Jesus. Again, it's being exposed right here. You need to intentionally, in the parable, seek out the lower place. And not only that, but verse 12. Notice Jesus, he turns. Verse 12, look at this. He turns, and who's he talking to now? It says to the one who invited him. So he's turning and like knowing, knowing like if you come to our house, let's just be honest, you know Tanya did the food because not to brag, but David just gave me a C uh, on Friday. He's like, well, you tried. Okay, it was okay, right? Like if you come up, you ain't thanking Andrew for that, right? Let's be honest. So now we're turning, Tanya, thank you for cooking and it's better than a C, right? It, it way better than that, okay? So we're turning to the host. Look at verse 12. When you do give a dinner, and you and you ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, I'm telling you, don't do that. Just them. And instead, you need to actually invite to the feast the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. 
Now, what we're talking about here is a very fancy word, okay? As you see on the screen, I put it down, quid pro quo. I believe we know that in political terms. You scratch my back, I scratch yours, right? It's, it's a the fancy word, it starts with an R, reciprocate, right? And so what would happen, guys, is if a lawyer invites him over, the Pharisee's like, well, I'll have you back over. So we, in the circle, in our clique, we look really fancy. We're not having any of those lower class people. We're going to hook each other up. That never happens in politics. Right? Even at a local level, like Lindale, right? I'm sure it happens, right? If I know someone, the mayor or whoever, I'm sure we can get certain things. I mean, guys, let's just be honest. I've been in the church my entire life. I'm telling you, I've seen some horror <laughs> in regards to the kitchen and the building schedule. I've seen, I've seen things, guys, in churches with budgets. You give me this, I'll give you that. Right? It happens. And that's a prideful attitude. It's a prideful attitude. Jesus says there shouldn't be a quid pro quo. There shouldn't be reciprocating. If I invite you, you'll invite me. Instead, look at verse 13. You should intentionally go out and find people that cannot reciprocate. They cannot give back to you. As you see on the screen, the idea of, uh, of poor, guys, they're reduced to beggary. Right? This is somebody that has nothing. That's going to be hard in America, isn't it? We, we, all have, we all have stuff. How about, how about the maimed? The idea here in the Greek is that something has literally happened to their limb, right, where they're disabled, right? Maybe they, they lost something. Uh, my, my wife and I, when we went to Africa in 2018, we saw, we saw kids with ear infections that were so bad their ear and part of their head was swollen. We've seen arms because gangry, ultimately is going to be gangry. There's just so much pus that they can't use their arm or their leg. It's bad. We have it really great in America, don't we? And so here's somebody, you need to go find that person, Jesus says. And you need to invite them to the feast. Somebody that's blind, right? They can't even see who you are. They can't even tell. You need to go do that. Why? Because you'll be blessed at the resurrection. John MacArthur writes that the lowly, the poor, the crippled, they have no capacity to give back. There's no quid pro quo there. You can literally serve them. You can literally help them. They cannot reciprocate. They cannot give back. But in Jewish culture, in Jewish culture, this is embarrassing. Why? Because to Jews, and still to this day, guys, it's all about hospitality. If I take you in, in Hebrews 13, don't forget to neglect that. If I take you in, it's assumed you're going to have me over. Right? It's, it's going to be assumed that you give back. And Jesus says you need to intentionally find people that cannot do that. The problem is, our pride gets in the way. I just don't want to. That's going to take effort. I got to like get the dishes out. I got to. I mean, for me, I got to go buy hot pockets. Okay, I was waiting for that one. All right, just all right. I'm still working on it. I got to up my game from a C to a B minus. Right? I'm going to have to talk to Jake about what to cook. And by the way, David, the next time you come over, I'm going to have the best darn omelet ever. Okay? It's, I'm throwing down the dog. Sorry, it's uh, inside there. Okay, but we're going to have to put some effort into it. Verse 14, you'll be blessed. Why? Because they cannot repay you. You're actually serving them. You're actually serving them. You're actually serving them. They cannot repay you. And you'll re be repaid when? At the resurrection of the just. If you see on the screen, the idea there is obviously... As we've seen in Matthew 25 explicitly there, when we come before the Lord, all of us, all of us are going to have to give an answer for how we lived, right? Salvation's all about Jesus. He died on the cross for my sin, but we're still going to answer, what do we do, right? What do we do knowing that Jesus died for my sin? Do we just sit there and be lazy or do we serve? And so Jesus said, you're going to be repaid then. That's when the rewards will come to you. What did you do with those talents? What did you do with the oil? What did you do? All those parables we've just seen. Again, what did you do? And unfortunately for us, we're very prideful, aren't we? I still want to take them in. I don't want to, I want, I don't want that to, to influence my schedule or this context with the, the Pharisees and the lawyers. They can't reciprocate, so I'm not going to reach out. I just, I just don't want to do that. One more time, pride. Oh. Humility is what saves us, folks. Because I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need to admit that I cannot do anything apart from me. 
You can do nothing. That was Jesus. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I can't do anything apart from Christ. We need that humility. I need to intentionally look to others. And instead, we're full of pride, aren't we? We're full of pride. John MacArthur writes, works, right? I'm going to do something to earn my way into heaven, which we see Islam still doing, Mormons still doing. We still we see Judaism. They're still doing it, right? I'm going to do, 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 all these things. That's human effort. That's a pride, pride issue. External, outward things are useless because it's still ultimately your pride. You think doing these things will get you to heaven when it's humility. Lord, I cannot get to heaven. I need salvation, Lord. I, in humility, I just want to serve you. I mean, amen. Do you see the difference, right? I just want to get back. On, on, on behalf of all that you've done for me, instead of it's about me and I can I can do what I want. There's no one is going to enter the kingdom of heaven by righteous deeds, our self-promotion, spiritual pride, our works. God is the only one that can save us, and it takes a humble heart to admit I need Jesus. So Glendale Baptist Church, as we close today, let's be really practical. I need Jesus to get through work. I need Jesus to save my marriage. I need Jesus to help me be the dad to raise good kids. I need Jesus if I'm going to serve this community. I need Jesus. Lord, forgive my pride. One more time, pride. I need you, Lord. If you look at the bottom of your, your bulletin, the bottom of the notes, I just want to recommend a book here. Just brings me just just to, to humility, honest to goodness. No, no bragging. That sounds great, but but all, just true from my heart. I want to recommend this book, Gentle and Lowly. I, I took a part of that the, the devotion from his book, guys. The the very heart of Jesus Christ is gentle and lowly, and you'll find rest. His heart is to come to him, but you gotta actually have the heart that says, "I need it." I don't need myself. I need more Jesus. And I love, I just love this, guys. There's the, the author does a fantastic job. So a war time, I would really recommend It's not a long book. It's 170 pages. Really, really big writing so that you can read it probably in a couple of hours. But gentle and lowly. And I love this because he gives countless verses. Jesus, in his humility, on the cross, did not curse. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them. Jesus, 